Good morning, everybody. Afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, can we get the agenda up? <laughs> I didn't memorize it. <laughs> um, so on the agenda today, we have a couple of reminders about uh, HackFest coming up in the two, three weeks and um, the, uh, the Global Forum in December. Um, so registrations are open for them and the call for papers for that. Todd can go over that in a second. Then we have um, uh, a couple of updates on uh, projects we have Explorer this week, Quilt next week. Uh, the architecture working group today. Hopefully, Ram is on. I didn't. I didn't check the uh, invite the the attendance rather. And then um, Dave, I think, is going to give us an update on Hyperledger Labs. Is there anything else to be added to the agenda? If not, then I think we can get going, so Todd. All right, sounds good. Uh, so the first thing is a uh, heads up that Hyperledger Global Forum will be December 12th through 15th in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, I know Brian had sent some additional information on this on the TSC thread last week. Uh, the main thing to note is we have a call for papers open right now. That's going to close on July 13th. Uh, so please take a look at the link there, get talks submitted for this. Um, just to reiterate, this is um, the major public summit for Hyperledger. Uh, it's 100% focused across the entire Hyperledger community, ecosystem, et cetera. Uh, so there'll be you know, the various talks and panels that we often see at these events, but there's also gonna be a lot of coding, collaboration, community building, uh, and whatnot. Um, so we definitely wanna hear a lot from the technical community. Um, as we're laying out the agenda for this. So please have a look at the CFP and um, get talk submitted. And then onward from there, uh, Amsterdam Hackfest is in uh, about two weeks, I wanna say. So let me drop the link into the TSC chat one moment. All right. Uh, so two things I'll say here, uh, we've seen tremendous interest in this uh, HackFest, so really excited for that. Uh, over 100 registered uh, for it and around 130 registered for the uh, initial day. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, if folks can click on the link, I just dropped in the TSC window. Uh, this is the draft agenda. Um, so previously we had met with a smaller group kind of to talk through the, the day zero training stuff as well as the broader HackFest. Uh, so we have mapped this out a bit better uh, in the link I just provided. Um, Tracy, if you're on, do you want to just talk quickly about the, the day zero and how we have that structured and what we need? Uh, and then from there, we can just spend one quick minute on mapping out the rest. Sure. So with day zero, we decided that the um, kind of the lightning talks that we had last time in L.A. were uh, too quick, and so we wanted to give some focus to the the people that were on it. The other the other challenge that we had was last time when we broke out into different sessions, we were basically breaking people into um, you know having to choose you know which one they wanted to to go to, and and really kind of breaking up the community on on the first day. And so we really felt that uh, it was necessary to keep people together um, and and go through. Uh, a shorter list of the projects and so um, what you see here is that we're going to do the standard welcome and introductions where we go around the room and introduce everybody that's uh, that's attending um, then we'll do kind of an introduction to Hyperledger where we talk about the projects and um, how you get involved in those sorts of things um, then we're going to focus on on fabric um, and really helping people get uh, set up with fabric um, you know, learning what fabric is, and, and then um, we thought maybe as as part of that hour and a half, kind of going through uh, maybe the getting started, uh, so that the community could then get some feedback on on kind of the documentation and, and what it's like to to get started for somebody who hasn't installed the, the project yet. Um, and then after lunch, do the same thing for for Sawtooth and for Indy. So what we're looking for is is obviously volunteers who can help. Um, provide that introduction to each of the the fabric sawtooth and indie projects, and then walk them, walk people through kind of getting started and and helping them, um, you know, kind of get their their machines set up. 
the um, and then of course you know just kind of being the the person who will um, you know gather the feedback for the the different communities to to figure out what it is that needs to be improved with the, the getting started. So I see uh, Chris is already volunteering for fabric, um, and then we'll need volunteers for uh, sawtooth and indie. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking for. Cool. Um, on the sawtooth side, I think uh, Sean Amundsen and I want to say Peter Schwartz and Adam Ludwig are planning on attending. So I'm sure any one of them would be happy to to do the intel. Or sorry, <laughs> happy to do the um, the uh, sawtooth coverage. We have a few folks coming for India as well, so we have a few options there. Tracy, is there anything maybe in yours or or that like talks about what's common between the three and what's different between the three, or is that just going to be left as an exercise for the people in attendance to take away? Um, so there's there's nothing specific in my uh, se section that uh, was going to cover that. We do, if you look down towards the um, the proposed agenda and topics. Um, we had talked about doing possibly an architectural comparison of the different frameworks um, on day, the other two days, um, Thursday or Friday. So uh, I think this is maybe a good place for us to start thinking about those sorts of things. And, um, you know, definitely, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to kind of you know, maybe we maybe we cut back on on something in earlier and uh, give ourselves some time at the very end just to do maybe the start of that comparison. Um, but I, I definitely think that's a, a good idea, Mark. Tracy, uh, that's Nikolai from uh, Hyperledger Roja speaking. I was really curious if our um, if our representative has some uh, voice on this Hackfest agenda, as I've seen, he has some suggestions in the end of this document, like the Roja team topic proposals, but I haven't seen any activity in the direction so that our proposals were included. Is that because he wasn't really uh, proactive and asking you for suggestions, or maybe you haven't seen them so far? Uh, so no, Nikolai, I did see those um, at the bottom of the document, and I, I think it's great that we're going to have some Aroha represent, representatives there. Um, and I think, you know, we can definitely include those in uh, day two or day three, right, The or whatever okay. you want to call them, two or three. Um, so Thursday and Friday, um, you know, the, right now we have completely open slots, uh, and I think it would be great if we could start slotting topics into um, Thursday and Friday, uh, they could okay. be from the, the topics that are proposed, uh, the Aroha topics, any of these topics I think uh, are really good topics for us to start slotting in. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether it should be a very technical uh, like a discussion of data model or maybe we can do the same like getting started. As I've seen, someone has proposed like getting started. Uh, on Hyperledger Fabric and the Sotos and Indy. Uh Can we do the same or like, what, what, is, what are the expectations of the participants in the Hackfest? I, I really want to understand. So, you know, it's difficult to tell, but many people are new to this, right? And like it's in Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah, so like getting started is usually much better. And then if we see that people really understand stuff, we accelerate. So we always assume that people don't know a lot. And then, yeah, so it's more kind of hand-holding at the beginning, especially in the labs. You know, when we start kind of getting people to compile code, download code, download Docker images, run uh, your first network or something like that. that, that's usually very helpful for people to get their hands dirty, right? Yeah, I agree. Now, so you can also have a presentation explaining more as well, right? It doesn't yeah. have to coding so I, I would actually recommend the following i think and and todd you know, tell me if we can if we can do this 
um, I think it would be good if we can have pointers, you know, if, if the <clears throat> fabric sawtooth and indie teams can get together a little sort of onboarding package email that provides, you know, links to download the software links yep. to the set up instructions, prerequisites, and that's so that people can do that as homework before they come rather than at the thing, because that oftentimes, especially if we're stressing the Wi-Fi and so forth can uh, be problematic. We can probably have some on thumb drives uh, to facilitate that, but it'd be great if people could actually do the homework and just, if, if they want to participate in the getting started, the, if they could download and get the software up and installed on their system. Exactly. And we're thinking the same thing. We've already chatted with our events team to get a section into the final conference that go out just so folks can walk through exactly that. Yeah. And I think we should probably also, well, the, the, the trouble with that would be, I would consider that email to be spam and I might not even look at it to be perfectly honest. Um, and okay. maybe a separate email that, you know, highlights that or, that, just that's fine as well and we can just send it kind of a thing oh i only say that because i mean you know every, everybody's really busy and some people are going to be traveling and so forth and i think it would just be um uh, good to try and and get as many of that you know handled as possible cool and we can have that come from you know tracy or me or whoever just so it's yeah exactly not, right make it a little bit more personal than just coming from great We'll do. Is there, um, since you are volunteering, Chris, um, uh, is there somebody specifically that we should be reaching out to for the different communities? If, if there's people online now that, um, well, can, I can, can Arno and I can craft, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, it's basically derivative of the getting started and, you know, and yep. so on and stuff. So, uh, we, we can craft that for you and, and, you know, you just got to let us know when you think you want to send it so we can. We can do that. I can't speak for the other team, obviously. But if, Should if I we... reach out Tracy? I'm, I'm sorry. Should I reach out Tracy or what's the plan? How can we send this getting started comp compilation? Yeah, Nicola, feel free to send it to me and okay. I'll make sure that it gets sent out. We'll, we'll make sure that it gets sent out to the uh, different participants that are going to be joining us. Um, Todd, when do we want to send that out by? Yeah, I was going to say if we can get that out early next week is probably best, just so folks have a week to um, factor this in. So if the projects can get stuff over to Tracy by end of day Monday uh, is ideal, if that's feasible. Okay. Cool. I know we have a, a bunch of other topics to get through today. So is there any <coughs> stuff on this or? Just no, one last thought. Again, for, uh, oh, go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just, just one last thought for for Nikolai. Usually, the way that that we've run these uh, these events, anybody can go in and, and add things to that agenda. So, if there's ever for this or a future event where you wanted to add, um, you wanted to add a session on something, and just you know, you can just go in and, and add it. Cool. And I think the important thing for this time, we have the um, grid built out in the Google Docs. So let's start mapping some of the stuff in the suggested items into actual times. Uh, and then I think people can hit the ground running once they get there. Awesome. Okay. Right. Um, who's doing Explorer? I think that's Parda who's doing it. I, I thought so too, but I don't see his name. So he may be dialed in, but I don't. Yeah, it looks like. Uh... Oh, there he is down the bottom. Doesn't look like he has voice though. So he may be dialed in one of the numbers above. I don't know. Parda, are you there? I think is does anybody know how to unmute yourself when you're on the phone? Um, if you press star six, it should unmute you. 
Okay, I'm on now. Yes, uh, great. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. So it's, uh, it should be a very quick update. So we have uh, we've been actually working on the Explorer, um, uh, you know, in the last quarter. Uh, the the project is uh, being developed uh, using agile methodology. We have daily standups. We, um, the standup, uh, the meeting details are, as as with any other project, they are posted on the wiki for anyone any anyone who is interested in joining uh, can attend those meetings. Um, and um, as of now, we have all the developers essentially are from DDCC. We had previously few contributors from uh, different companies but then they uh, they they worked on the project for some time and then they dropped off right um the latest one was from inspur um we had one developer working actively with us uh, but uh, recently he stopped contributing and we're not sure when he'll be back uh, as far as the the functionality is concerned we have upgraded uh, the uh, the code base to support Fabric 1.1. Uh, we've been doing some of the cleanup uh, that's required to support different platforms. So uh, a lot of the work in this quarter has been about cleaning up the code, reacting, reacting it, um, and to make it easy for, in fact, to make uh, so that everyone else, you know, maybe somebody who is new to this code base, can also contribute. Uh, so, so that's the work that's been going on, and also. Uh, we've been uh, talking to the AWS folks who who created the template out of the fabric as well as the Explorer, um, trying to work with them and to see how to improve this one so that it's much easier to package it also. Uh, as far as the functionality is concerned, um, we think we are getting very close to what we wanted to achieve. Um, and um, And since based on the JIRAs, and the stories, it may not be very clear actually what is the scope of this project. We are creating a we're creating a requirements document that um, that has detailed functionality, and we'll post that also into the Git um, into the repository. Uh, and um, and one last thing, because this is really a UI application, uh, we are looking at the 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 usability. Uh, so we are working. We're going to work towards um, improving the both the look and feel, plus also the uh, also the how the application flows. So that's that's really the only significant thing that's pending. There are few things when we, especially regarding the fabric, um, there are several uh, features that are not supported. Uh, as and when we find the things that uh, that needs to be. Uh, available for Explorer, if they are not supported, we are raising Jira tickets for Fabric guys, Fabric team to work on. Okay. Um, other than that, uh, the only request I have is anybody who is, any one of you who is interested in contributing to Explorer, if you guys can join the project, or if you know anyone who is interested, um, if they can join and help us uh, extend the support for other platforms, that will be useful, very useful because um, otherwise, we won't be actually be able to get out of incubation uh, right now. DTCC is the only one that's actually working and maintaining um, the code base for Explorer. Okay. Um, any questions or comments? Do you support Do you support Fabric One uh, One Point Two Beta? Have you tried it or not yet? Not we haven't yet tried One Point Two. Okay. Uh, we, we have time for that. I'm just, just wondering. Thank you. Okay. I think maybe coming out of the, the last update, there was some interaction with the contributors who had provided the Sawtooth Explorer and the beginning of some collaboration there to, to bring some, some more contributions into the Hyperledger Explorer project. Um, I don't see any so of that reflected in the update. Uh, could you speak a little bit? About so, it? yeah, we had um, right after that we had, I think, probably two calls with them, and then there was no activity. And suddenly, just uh, just the last week, uh, they said they they are going to start working on it. So, other than that one email, we don't have any update as to you know what the current status is. So, 
uh, maybe maybe they uh, they'll have some free time to work on this thing. Uh, I can probably report that in the next update. But so far, they haven't done any work that we know of. Okay. Well, good. That it sounds like there's maybe something coming soon. And I think there's. Yes. I think I've got a note in in my inbox that I haven't gone through yet from Tuesday that seems to have some uh, design write up in it. So there might be a little bit more uh, more meat behind that now. Okay. Yeah. So I will edit this update to include that also that Pocket is uh, working on it, right? Um, yeah, so that would make it essentially two contributors, right? DDCC and Pocket. I think we would need at least one more contributor to get out of incubation. Any any other comments or questions? So, what functionality are missing in Fabric Node SDK? Like, uh, what, what, just just. What are the known issues if you want to integrate this? So it's not necessarily known issues. For example, a block hash, right? Block hash is not, there is no API for that. Um, everyone seems to be, they, they have to calculate the block hash. Yeah. Instead of everyone having to calculate, I think it would be nice. Uh, it's either the API or the fabric itself provides that one, right? That's mm -hmm. one, and there are other, for example, I have no way of uh, showing in the Node Explorer what's the status of the node, right? Whether the node is actually connected to the network or or there is, uh, um, or is it, um, are there any issues with the node, right? Um, so the node status APIs are not available. Um, there are other, I believe, um, for example, the block creation time or smart, the chain code deployment time, uh, Few things like that they they can be inferred by the when they are included in the block, but not necessarily. Um, uh, you know, they're not those timestamps. They're not directly available from the VA itself. So we have this list of few things. I can send them out to you guys uh, if if you are interested. I believe the team has created the Jira tickets. If not, they are at least in the process of creating them. Okay, okay. So it's not it's not that they're like issues. It's more like you are waiting for some more functionality that you would like to yeah. have in the SDK so that you can operate better. That right? is true. Yeah. That is true. So Not sounds, necessarily issue or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's just like that we need more. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. I think okay. most of the 1.2 SDK work should be wrapping up um, next Friday. Yeah, yeah. We're looking API soon, so you can start. Right. And yeah. um, actually, the thing that I was thinking would be probably most interesting in Explorer and would be the service discovery information to be able to understand, you know, what are my peers, where are my ordering services and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like monitoring, like health so, monitoring we don't have, but yeah. Well, but there is um, so the service discovery a, is available right now. In yeah, there's a metrics three? API, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, then in that case, we, yeah, we will look into the 1.2 API because then it has, looks like it has a lot more information more. than, yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a metrics gRPC API, but I'm not sure that there's anything in the SDK <laughs> for that. Okay. Yeah, the, the best thing is just Thanks, to request pardon? features. I think that's Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Thanks, Parda. Okay. Any, no, other, no or any other questions for Parda? I mean, any suggest? I mean, we you know we had a really pretty good discussion about, um, you know, Aroha, and uh, how to you know to grow that community. Um, I I don't know part of if you were on for that, but you know, there's a number of different strategies that people can take to try and you know grow their committership and uh, you know potentially grow new uh, maintainers and so forth. Um, uh, were, were you on for for that discussion? No, I think I joined at the very you know tail end of the discussion. Yeah, so you might want to sort of go back and and review the uh, uh, you know, I can dig up which which week it was, um, and okay. review the the audio for that. I think there's probably some great insights that you might be able to 
gain as to how to, you know, how to get people to come and play in your sandbox. Um, and so I would, I would encourage that. Okay. Uh, I'll definitely and then, you know, I, I think, you know, reaching out to Rye and, 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 and Tracy also, you know, for assistance and how we can help you to grow your, your team there would be good. Okay. I will. Okay. Yeah. So I'll get, get in touch with both of them. Right. And um, I'll review the audio also. Awesome. Okay. Ram, are you there? Hi folks, Ram here. Uh, just yes. uh, finding the unmute button as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. So, uh, architecture work group up, uh, update. Um, you know, uh, the the health has been health of the working group has been uh, great. Uh, we have the same steady participation of uh, eight to twelve uh, folks, uh, with a few new participants coming in. Um, some of them. Uh, um, um, uh, a few of them have uh, become steady uh, participants, but most of them come and go. Uh, but there's been a, a solid core of participation uh, uh, representing uh, multiple companies and projects. Uh, we're making uh, steady progress on uh, several work items. Uh, we published the second architecture paper on uh, smart contracts a few weeks ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll talk about the other work items. Uh, um, below. Um, so, <coughs> pardon me. Bless you. Uh, so there are no major issues at this time. Um, uh, I would say the main thing we need help on is to kind of uh, encourage participation, uh, especially from uh, the different projects, uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, all the other uh, work groups uh, and uh, projects here, we are contribution driven. Um, you know, if, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, it would be great if, uh, you know, we could kind of encourage, uh, projects to nominate, uh, art work group, uh, 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 participants. So, and, you know, encourage them to kind of, uh, uh, attend the meetings and contribute. Um, you know, all of us are busy in the projects with releases coming on and so forth, but, uh, you know, this is an important uh, um, you know, community effort. So uh, it'll be great if we can kind of uh, uh, have uh, participation from all the active projects. Um, so, um, you know, would, would uh, ask for the TSE's help uh, to see what we can do more to kind of encourage that. Thoughts, questions on that? Uh, overall activity in the past quarter, uh, so we've been um, um, following two parallel tracks. We meet every other week. Uh, on, um, the main track meets on Wednesday a.m. and uh, the privacy and confidentiality track uh, alternates on the other other week on Fridays. Um, and uh, um, we are, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, on the main track, we've uh, completed uh, uh, the smart contract paper and we are working on the identity services um, you know, functions. And when that gets done, uh, we'll convert that into a paper as well. Uh, and we're just kicking off discussion on interoperability. Um, privacy and confidentiality track, Mick drives uh, that and uh, we're making steady progress uh, on uh, developing an ideal model based on a trade finance use case. Um, and that, that's going um, steadily. Um, so uh, work products, uh, we are working the next uh, next uh, work items uh, will drive work products. One is on the identity services paper and the other will be on the privacy and confidentiality paper. Uh, I already mentioned on the participation, uh, really need your help to kind of uh, get more uh, folks uh, from the projects to participate. Thoughts, suggestions, questions? Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, mention of this ideal model um, recently, and I wonder if, if you or, or one of the other folks on the 
uh, on that track could just say a little bit about that. So I'll do my best not to butcher it and Hart can jump in and save me when I do. Um, <clears throat> the, ideal the idea behind the ideal model is you describe essentially um, <laughs> how the system, how you expect the system to behave using um, kind of idealistic assumptions. So for example, you, you describe it in terms of a trusted third party um, and the, the characteristics of that might look like um, uh, something that can process messages in a particular way, which gives us a way of representing um, uh, something that has the characteristics of a typical distributed ledger. And then you can use that ideal model um, as a basis for comparison um, uh, and analysis of the existing implementations and systems that you have. Um, and you can use it to drive um, uh, requirements, um, uh, and requirements discussion, which actually is, has been kind of the focus over the last few weeks on it. So it's, it's a vehicle for um, both uncovering assumptions um, and ultimately for um, uh, providing a basis for analysis. Yeah, um, that's exactly right, Mick. Um, fundamentally, Dan, the basic idea is that it's very difficult <laughs> to analyze exact security properties of a blockchain, right? You know, what about traffic analysis? What about, you know, kind of all of these other potential side channels that may show up? So the idea is if you can take your blockchain system and show that the security is equivalent to something much simpler, then you've effectively gained something because you can look at the simple thing and say, okay, well, you know, these attacks like traffic analysis and other things are, are very evident here. You can really see uh, see what's going on, um, and and this is this is called the the ideal model. Uh, it goes back to the definitions from this thing called universally composable security. Uh, but but it's as Mick pointed out, it's just a, it's a way to sort of see security properties about a system and to to write them down, uh, because otherwise they're they're it's very very difficult to to concretely say things about security. Did that answer your question? Yeah, so I'm imagining aspects of this are like showing indistinguishability to a random oracle. So using techniques like that. Um, sort of, yeah. But it's basically like uh, saying that, you basically say that any adversary that can, you know, do something, some kind of attack on a blockchain can also do the same attack on some kind of very simple system with a trusted third party. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you can, you know, look at that trusted third party system. Uh, and, and I should say the vice versa is the more important direction, right? Any, well, yeah. Okay. The, the attacks are important. Yeah. So, yep. so you can look at the third, the simple trusted third party system, and it's very easy to see what the security guarantees are, right? Mm -hmm. Involving like traffic analysis or, or other things like that. And you can say, you know, if an attack is here, it applies to the blockchain, but if not, you know, it doesn't. So it's, it's, um, yeah, that, that's basically the idea. It's a way of just exact, it's, it's a way to kind of, uh, to write down the security of a blockchain system in kind of a, a simple and concrete manner, because otherwise, you know, um, Otherwise, you know, things like traffic analysis uh, in particular, you know, for some blockchain systems, you, you don't care. Uh, for others, you might care a lot, right? Uh, and and, so, and it can be difficult to analyze whether, you know, uh, whether something is a problem for you or not. And so, so that's what the, the goal of this is to do, is to, to, simplify, to simplify things so that, uh, so that you can make a decision about whether the system is secure for your purpose, I guess. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, we've had uh, interesting discussions in the work group on the on the name itself, and it seems like ideal model is the uh, the, the the standard term used in the security research community. Uh, you know, the rest of us probably would think of it as more of a reference model. Uh, to allow us to analyze and reason about uh, the system. You can thank Ron Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to chime in, 
as you know, uh, Dan, uh, the engineer's um, viewpoint and the, uh, you know, the, the abstraction that is being built around the TPP, uh, I mean, uh, TTP, uh, you know, trusted third party, because it has other meanings in other contexts. Uh, that's what we needed to get resolved in the privacy and confidentiality track, which is uh, what, you know, a lot of that debate was about because we are also used to creating abstractions, uh, but, you know, we, we were uh, basically debating the use of the, the validity and the use of this technique in order to model something like trade finance. Next. <coughs> uh, so that's all I had. Uh, any other questions and comments? Um, you, you know, one request would be to see, you know, is there um, what else we can do to kind of encourage uh, the, the, the projects to kind of nominate someone to participate? Uh, if there are any thoughts on that? That'll be great. Okay, thanks, Ron. Thanks, folks. Um, who's, uh, is Dave, who's beyond? Uh, Chris, I'm doing the labs update. Tracy's doing it, okay. <laughs> well, I'm just going by last <laughs> email, so sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah. No worries. yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, the first time that we've been doing a, or that we're doing a labs update. Um, so we've been kind of in process for at least a quarter, if not a little longer. And uh, during that time, we uh, put together a process for proposing a Hyperledger Lab. And we've had, uh, since that process has been put in place, five different labs that have been proposed to, to the stewards. Three of those have been accepted and uh, one of the proposals is still in process. And then one of them was uh, deemed out of scope and, and was withdrawn. So of the three that were accepted, uh, we have uh, private data objects, which is uh, technology for confidentiality, preserving off-chain smart contracts. Um, it's been fairly active uh, since it was created on March 2nd. And uh, we have the crypto library um, that was created on March 29th, which is really intended to create a shared uh, cryptography module for uh, cross project use and then we've had uh, s parts uh, software parts for doing spdx and, and tracking kind of the open source components that are used to build uh, a piece of software so um, this update was actually created or updated on tuesday morning um, I, I did notice that uh, yesterday as of yesterday there was at least one pr merged into the s parts so all three of our labs that have been accepted have had uh, activity since they've been accepted and so that's a, a good sign. We're also starting to see some labs uh, projects come in that are based on the interns, uh, internships that are happening this summer. <laughs> so I expect to see probably some more of those. I think the labs is a, a good place for us to do um, internship projects. Obviously, with internship projects or any sort of labs that come in, we, we need a sponsor for those projects as, as we agreed to when we created Hyperledger Labs. Um, the sponsor has to be either a, a TSC member or a, um, a project maintainer. So um, look to see you know, if, if there's internship projects that make sense for you to sponsor as a TSC member or a project maintainer. Um, that that uh, makes sense, then, then definitely feel free to, to offer your sponsorship to those projects. So yeah, I, I mean, that's a very quick update, but uh, lab seems to be going uh, fairly well so far. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I, I saw there was, there was a little bit of chat uh, going about whether to say open up JIRA projects mm -hmm. for, for labs. 
could you speak just in general about the overhead in, in running the labs at this point? Are there any, um, I don't know, hot spots that you see or, or coming on the horizon? And then if you've got any thoughts specifically about uh, the JIRA discussion. Yeah, thanks, thanks Dan for bringing that up. Um, so uh, hot spots as far as running labs, uh, there doesn't seem to be much um, in the way of, of overhead, right? Uh, really the stewards are, are doing a really good job of reviewing uh, lab proposals as they come in, um, you know, and then once, once they've been approved by um, at least two of the stewards, we create the, the GitHub project in the, the Hyperledger Labs organization. And, that's a fairly straightforward process, right? As far as just copying the um, MD file that was um, the original proposal to the README and, and setting up the the actual project. Um, and then to, to talk about kind of the JIRA side of the house or the, tr the issue tracking side of the house, um, you know, I, I don't think we really had discussed what, what we wanted to do there, right? I think there was some assumptions made by people who excuse me, um, you know, assume that GitHub issues would be the, the mechanism for tracking issues for labs. Um, but then I, I think it was the private data objects um, lab that had requested a, a JIRA project be created. And um, we, we had a, as Dan mentioned, a discussion on the labs rocket chat channel about, um, you know, whether that's what people expected or, or what we should do there. Um, and we didn't really come to any sort of conclusions. And so I think this is definitely a good topic for um, TSC discussion as far as, you know, what, what process we want to follow for, um, you know, whether we create JIRA projects um, on request only, whether we create JIRA projects for all lab projects, uh, or, or what we really want to do there. But if I remember, um, this is Vipin, um, we had discussions on this topic and uh, I think uh, several people, including Arno and myself, said that there should be low gating factor for the labs. That was the whole reason the labs were set up and we shouldn't make uh, too many demands on exactly what they should uh, be following. Um, so, I mean, I guess the TSC has to opine on that particular uh, aspect uh, of the labs that it should be an open uh, situation once you are uh, in the labs uh, you you have uh, lots of freedom um, obviously you have to follow some uh, processes but we cannot use uh, you know uh, heavy process sort of heavy process management and that's why it's not a project it's a lab uh, and uh, that was discussed. Also, one more point on this was that um, uh, in order to add uh, new lab stewards, uh, uh, Rai's name was proposed and we, the stewards felt comfortable that he should be added. Uh, but uh, according to the charter, it is uh, meant to be approved also by the TSC. Should we just take yeah. a, a quick second and just vote on adding Rye? Yep. Hopefully that will be straight. Anybody opposed to adding Rye? Going once, going twice, he's added. Outstanding. Um, just to comment on the Jira side of things, that which is the flip side of what what uh, Vipin was just talking about, which is we already have a JIRA that we're using for the private data objects work internally. Um, it, we would like to be able to move as much of our development process as possible externally. Um, and we were just kind of, the question for us was really what resources are available to us um, in order to do this as opposed to, you know, we're not looking for JIRA to be a requirement for the projects. We're just looking for resources that we can use in order to start establishing that collaborative development process. Right. So this is Arno. I, I think that's the indeed the point. I mean, as as Vipin said, I mean, we didn't want to put much, you know, requirement on the labs. The, the, but the question is really on the other side, how much requirements can labs put on the staff or the resources, the infrastructure in general? I mean, 
at the end of the day, you know, I was being conservative in the discussion we had on the channel. I said, well, probably we should just stick to Gita because it's there and that's good enough. But, you know, I'm not formally opposed to providing Jira for labs who want it if the staff feel like, well, that's a very small burden to them. But as I pointed out, the question is, well, then where do you draw the line? If we just say, yeah. well, people get GitHub repo, they get the issues, you know, that comes with GitHub and that's it. It's easy to just stick to that. But, you know, if we say, oh, they want Jira, sure, give them Jira. The next one says, I want Garrett. And the next one wants what not. I don't know. You know, I don't know. So. It was just seemed easier to just say, nope, stick to GitHub, period. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Arno. Appreciate it. Well, so. <laughs> no, the, 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 and by the way, the serious side of that is, is that, like I said, we already have the existing processes that we have. We already have the resources. We're trying to find a way to get a machine outside our firewall so that we can do some CI integration on our own. Um, mm -hmm. I think GitHub allows us to put some additional hooks in. We've been trying to figure out if we can make that work. Um, having Not having administrative access does make it a little bit challenging to add some of that stuff in on the GitHub pieces of it. But it's just it's really just a matter of trying to figure out what, what the expectation should be. Um, are there best known methods for how we should do this we could share with others as well? Yeah. So hey, this so, this is this is an ask, not a demand. Just yeah, yeah, no, no, we can talk about it. We'll do it. If not, we'll figure something else out. We had a lot right, of issues. So, so Nick, I, I think you know maybe this is sort of also the point at which you start thinking about well, is this really a lab or is this a project? It um uh, that that is a very good question, Chris, and and I'm happy to explore it. We we. The biggest issue for us is just sort of how long and how broad is the commitment that we're willing to make, to mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so precisely the reason for doing the labs is to try to get others who are interested in the technology so that we yeah. can get that persistence. So I would be hesitant to propose it as a project until I felt like we could step away or we could change our role and, and, and the project would still be valuable enough to others that it would continue on. That's that's my criteria, um, mm -hmm. for sort of making that that switch. So, if, right. that, if, if that makes sense, and you know, if you have other opinions, I'm happy to talk about it. But but that's where that's the approach we've been taking on it. Well, but that's also sort of really what incubation is for, right? So, okay. Um, but um, you know, and and, and I so. I, I think it's worth giving it a little bit of thought um, of, you know, potentially incubating and maybe, you know, the additional socialization that I know you're doing um, uh, and, and maybe some additional socialization at the Hackfest, uh, you know, at the end of the month, mm -hmm. um, you know, will give you some fodder to, you know, consider maybe this should be incubated. Right. Okay. Um, I think that's a good question, Chris. Um, and, and I'm happy to have that discussion and I, I would appreciate your input on that. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, <coughs> we're doing a session. we've already got signed up for a session, um, at Amsterdam to go through this as an intro and tutorial kind of thing. So, well, so we can really roll up our sleeves. It is like an hour or two. We can really boost it a little bit, you know, even if we don't call it incubation, we, we spend a lot of time both on the GitHub kind of uh, CI integration and with Garrett, right? So we, we, uh, we, we can share some experiences happily. That'd be, that'd be great, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah sure. So. No problem. Yeah, okay. I, sorry, no, I, to continue that thread really quickly, I'd be interested in, uh, and curious to hear what people think about when some of these lab projects should become regular projects. Uh, something like, obviously the crypto lib is, a, you know, uh, <laughs> on my mind. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm with Mick. I'd be curious to hear, Chris, what you have to say about that. Yeah, well, I think that that's actually probably another one that, you know, it may be starting to get a little bit of, you know, interest outside the initial, you know, cabal that, that sort of cooked up the idea. And, and, you know, maybe that's, again, I think we're all learning here, right? We're all <laughs> sort of trying to feel out what's right, but, you know, once that does start to happen, maybe, you know, that's a good time to start thinking about, 
bringing it over and, and doing a formal incubation. It gets a little more attention. It gets care and feeding. You can use the tools and so forth. Um, okay, yeah. but I, I feel like we have sidetracked a little bit here because, you know, independently of whether some of these projects may be ready sooner than later to, to move to incubation, uh, the question remains when it comes to a lab, what tooling are we, you know, willing to provide? Could somebody from um, from yeah. LF comment on the the overhead for creating an, another project in Jira? I, I really don't know off the top of my head if this is just a trivial thing or if uh, you know if three or four other projects or, or other labs rather mm -hmm. wanted to do that. If that would become oppressive or costly. So what are the differences? It's just the Jira, the GitHub is the same, right? And the official CIX support. Like what, what are the differences in terms of investment at the moment? I think it's just, it's just the Jira at the moment, right? Yeah, I mean, this was just specifically around if a lab wants Jira so that yeah. they can- How much more overhead is process. Yeah. yeah. Creating a Jira project is, uh, pretty low uh, amount of effort. What I would propose instead is that instead of each project getting one, we just create a labs project and then labs projects can uh, file their bugs under that. Yeah, we can use a component in Jira if, if it's really not a lot, if it's not like hundreds and hundreds of issues per project, per, per lab, right? We can have a component or something like that to differentiate and then right. we can position it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would there be an easy migration from components in one project into a new project if a lab um, graduated into its own project? So no commitment, but we had a very strong Jira guy and he used to use the Jira query language and he can slice and dice everything you wanted and then he would take that output and insert it into a new project. Yeah, like we needed a Jira expertise here a little bit, but he used to do it like in an hour or two. We used to like, yeah, so I think would it's that, Would that be but, more effort rather than just creating a project from the get-go? It's a little bit more effort, yeah. It's a little bit more effort. It would be more effort. Uh, I just, I'm a little bit uh, leery of <laughs> uh, a ton of Jira projects. Yeah, because the numberings are going to change as well, right? That's the main problem that we had. So you have like labs one, two, three, right? And then I'm going to move to my next big incubated project, and the issue is gonna be number two. And then what they do with the links, right? So it's a little bit more work, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But Jira is not that easy for the beginners. Maybe GitHub Review is more friendly. Although it's already bought by Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, actually, I'm just gonna press enter. <laughs> <laughs> I had a joke waiting. If you look at the chat, we should check into Microsoft, right? We shouldn't check into GitHub. <laughs> you can use Visual Team Studio, whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> no, no, I think uh, that GitHub is actually easier. Honestly, it is easier. It's like, you know, a pull request and the flow is easy. If it's a small project, you know, the, the overhead in bootstrapping is almost none. Hi, yeah, I this think is, this is more. This is Leonard. I just wanted to know a um, lab which is similar to having a sandbox, which literally uh, there is a need to allocate resources for whatever will run in that lab. Because uh, potentially you could have several, you might say, mm. um, many projects running at the same time. So, what would be the process for allocating resources like um, machine time? um space uh cycles um in that sort of sandbox environment is this something that we need to consider or not so i was going to say i heard you know i mean we, we the number of labs we're talking about for now is obviously pretty minimal and quite frankly i was i wasn't sure how much how many labs would be proposed when we launch this whole thing? And clearly we haven't seen an explosion. So of course, you know, that, that might change in the future, but maybe we don't have to worry about too much, uh, uh, you know, having an explosion in labs that becomes completely unmanageable. Yeah, we can look at a solution for the, let's say for the coming quarter. And then in three months we can revisit, right? 
I, yeah, I just want to bring up maybe uh, something that we talked about when, when Labs was originally created, just to make sure that we're thinking about this, which is the fact that we don't want to confuse labs with projects, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, just let's make sure that whatever we decide, we're, we're not uh, confusing labs with projects. I support Arno and um, Tracy right here saying that we shouldn't be overthinking this. What would happen if uh, they migrate to a project? Then, of course, you may have to put in some effort into doing that. But the issue that we are discussing here is more to Arno's point is uh, whether resources should be available from a general pool to a specific lab project to do JIRA. And if so, you know, what kind of resources, how much commitment to Dan's point, what is the effort needed? It, what I know. heard there was it's low effort. I'd say let's take an experimental approach to this and yeah. let's let this lab have a, let's give this lab a, a JIRA project. And if that turns into a debacle, then, then we don't need to do that for future labs. And if it turns out that it's no big deal, then we know uh, that's an option open to the labs that want to use that as part of their community building. Yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable proposal given that, you know, the cost seems pretty low. Yeah. If the number stays low, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to keep labs like, you know, even though separate than, than real projects that are incubated and voted for, I'm happy to kind of keep, st still make people feel that they're like a first class citizen, even though it's just gauging the water. Yeah. And, and, and get people used to it, right? So the switch is going to be easier, actually. From If we have a JIRA project and then to go to incubation, it's actually less overhead if you think about how many will get incubated, right? So when we, we, we still need to make sure that they remember that they're labs. If, yeah. So this is a lab. Be careful. This is a lab. Be careful. Yeah. Don't trust these people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I agree with Tracy. All right. We're at end of job, I think. So thanks, everyone. And we'll talk at y'all next week. Ciao. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Ta-ta. <coughs> Ta-ta. <laughs> You cannot you cannot kick me out automatically. All right, all right. I'll do it. Bye. <laughs>